Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. Oh, this is a nice microphone. I have to bring it very close. Uh, thank you all for joining us here today on November 10th in the EarthDay.org Climate Education Pavilion. Uh, I'm Matthew Arouk. I am the Director of Global Education, and I'm very happy to be introducing this panel, Youth and Educators for Global Climate Action, Participation, Collaboration, and Implementation of UNESCO's Greening Education Partnership. Before I introduce our esteemed panelists, I just thought I would tell you a little bit about our organization and about the work that our global education program is doing. So EarthDay.org, our mission is to diversify, educate, and act the world's largest movement. So you can see that education is central to our mission and within our global education program, we have a couple of lines of action, right? So we're all about kind of creating, collecting, sharing, into the hands of teachers and educators and students and parents, communities, so they can build out effective climate and environmental literacy programming. Second, we have kind of a policy and advocacy component. You're seeing that here at COP27. We did a lot of work around UNESCO's Transforming Education Summit over the summer in June through and October. Uh, we have a lot of coalition building and networking. We do some research, and then a lot of our work is about good information out into the public. So here at COP, our goal here is to get education and to really elevate the role of education and education-related issues in the climate action space. So we want to ensure that education is part of the negotiation agenda here, but also in all future COPs moving forward. So with all of your support and participation, we'll be able to do that. With that, I'll stop talking and turn it over to the panelists. So we have kind of three parts to our session today. First, we'll have some opening remarks. Then we have a panelist of youth and educators, and then we have some closing remarks. So to start us off, I'll introduce our opening three panelists who probably don't need much of an introduction. Uh, to start off our opening remarks, we have the Assistant Director General for Education, Stefania Giannini. Uh, that will follow by Professor Jeffrey Sachs from Columbia University, who is also the chair of Mission 4.7. Both Stefania and Professor Sachs are longtime educators working uh, within universities, working with education communities, and really pushing forward our education for sustainable development, education for climate action agenda. After we hear from the two of them, we have a video from uh, Judy Browse, who's the executive director of the North American Envir Association for Environmental Education, NAAAE. So I will stop talking now, and I will turn it over to uh, Assistant Director General Stefania Giannini. Thank you. Thank you very much, Matthew. Good morning, everybody. Can you hear me well? Yeah. It's, uh, it's a great pleasure, a great honor to be with you today to open uh, together with my dear friend and colleague, uh, Professor Jeffrey Sachs, this important section. And thanks to youth.org. Uh, 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 dot org for organizing with us uh, this session. As you mentioned, uh, Matthew, the, uh, the goal, the uh, objective of this uh, meeting today, uh, at the very early morning of this intensive program we have, is to position education uh, really at the core of negotiation, not to have uh, a nice ad to discuss, in uh, many meetings, which is already something. We must uh, be aware that uh, we are making progress. Uh, I remember Glasgow 20, COP26, where we had uh, the very first uh, uh, ministerial meeting where ministers of education and ministers of, of environment discuss about a common agenda to develop. However, we must be more ambitious now because this is a special time. I mean, we all know we are all aware that uh, is the battle for our lives, as the Secretary General uh, Guterres uh, 
actually clearly mentioned in his introductory remarks to this COP and many other occasions. But I think that the real change this year is that the education community, through the Transforming Education Summit initiative, which is about uh, uh, rethinking the way we are, we, are, we are learning, we are teaching to transform society, put climate change education, education for sustainable development, what we call uh, in SDG 4 language 4.7, the real transforming power of education at the core of the agenda. So what we want to do here is to uh, preach the not converted, I would say. To, to, to say that, uh, to, to talk to all experts on climate change, all uh, activists, uh, all politicians, uh, leaders who are uh, very much involved in this COP, that the next negotiation from Sharm to uh, UAE next year have to include education as a pillar of the discussion and the agenda to address climate change effectively. Why that? Because education, I mean, we are, now I'm preaching the converted, I know, but we know that it's very much about the real tool we have uh, to change mindset, to bring better knowledge, to raise better awareness, and to change behaviors. That's what we want to have and what we need at individual level, at society level. So we have, uh, I mean, also a special uh, conditions to start from, uh, as you maybe know, at the Transforming Education Summit in New York, we are together with other, maybe many of you, youth leading this process this time. We launch uh, a new alliance we call Green in Education Partnership, which is focusing on four areas, clear, simple areas to propose governments and ministries to implement, green in schools, green in learning, green in teachers uh, and making teachers prepare to address the climate change effectively, uh, not only about the content, but also about uh, the approach, which is a, a whole school, a holistic approach. And finally, really last but not least, the green in community, because this is not a matter of business in the classroom. This is an approach which must go beyond the education uh, uh, communities and constituencies. So we also want to invite all of you, and especially young, pe young people here, uh, to be part of this uh, partnership, to, to relaunch in all the meetings we are uh, requested to attend, the importance of having concrete outcomes to be measured in a few months and years in order to be, it's an open space uh, uh, to discuss, uh, it's nice like this, but we are louder than the, the noise behind us. Yeah, that's the point. <laughs> And uh, I, really, I really wish to, to conclude inviting all of you also behind this nice open space to make the case for education, for climate change, because it's an important component. It cannot be a nice to head at the end or at the beginning of the COP. Thank you very much. Please join us. You can count on UNESCO. Uh, and its commitment. Thank you. Let me let me uh, join in celebrating the importance of education for all that we're trying to accomplish. But let me even start stepping back for one moment. Our overarching ambition to shape the future we want is a sustainable development future where each part of the world is able to make economic progress with social justice and with environmental sustainability. We have 17 goals as a framework for that in the SDGs. But I really want to assert that SDG 4, which is quality education for all, is the central objective of all of the 17 SDGs. 
because there is no way that any society can make progress or make any kind of claim to decency or solve the problems of climate change or environmental sustainability without children being well-educated, well-informed, empowered, and also inspired by teachers and imbued with virtues of cooperation and understanding and a culture of peace and tolerance. And that's why in the SDGs, as Stefania mentioned, SDG target 4.7 is really notable. SDG 4 at the core, we need kids in school, we need them learning. And SDG 4.7 is we need them learning about sustainable development in the broad sense. Of course, specifically about greenhouse gases and anthropogenic climate change and mitigation and adaptation, but more broadly about culture, tolerance, peace, sustainable lifestyles, decency, things that children should learn in a classroom. And thank you to the teachers here for your commitment and contribution to that. My impression is that we're not in a good shape in general on this, however. And I remember when we walked into the Transforming Education Summit, there was a sign of UNESCO and UNICEF out in front of the United Nations, which said that only one in three children can read a basic paragraph, understand it, and explain it. And since then, we've had another study, rather grim, showing that even basic skills in this way are not being reached by well over half of children in the world today. And we know that hundreds of millions of children are not in school. And governments can't even afford keeping them in school in many low-income countries. So I want to put our discussion even in the broader context. Education is at the core of a decent society. It is at the core of sustainable development. It is at the core of any of our hopes. And we really need, thank goodness for UNESCO's leadership, we really need to support a dramatic increase of funding of effort, of political attention to the crisis of education so that we can ensure every child a future. And without that, we're really not going to make it, I'm sorry to say. So this is our first task. When we have the resources, the wonderful things that can be done are inspiring, and we see that all over the world in the mission 4.7 program that the UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network with UNESCO and in support of UNESCO and with the Vatican and with former Secretary General Ban Ki-moon and his foundation are seeing in our work to propound and propel target 4.7 is inspiring teaching and inspiring young people taking up this call all over the world in very, very creative ways. We have a global schools program. If you are part of it, wonderful. If you're not part of it, I'm sachs at columbia.edu, S-A-C-H-S at columbia.edu. Just drop me a note. I will connect you with uh, people who can help share curriculum and ideas and connections and networks to help you as teachers and your schools and your communities and your education commissioners locally and your ministers of education to really scale up this effort. One of the wonderful parts of teaching sustainable development is experiential teaching. And I just want to conclude on this point. 
we can do many wonderful things, but I think even at primary school, children can learn. By the way, I should, I'll, I'll caution in one moment, but children, I was going to say children can learn about the electricity in their school and how it can be made with solar panels or how it can be zero carbon. Of course, all over the world, there are schools without electricity and without connectivity. This is impossible for the 21st century. Schools need to be connected. They can't be without infrastructure. They can't be on a dirt floor and a thatched roof or no roof anymore because we're not going to get what we need now. We need to mobilize the resources so that there is a basic infrastructure so that teachers can teach and share materials and connect students to online information and to students in other parts of the world and so on. But I was going to say that in schools with electricity or schools that are going to put in electricity with solar panels, even very young children can learn and begin to understand and make solutions and can be given an assignment. How can your school be green? And also, how can your school adapt to climate change? What does climate mean for you? For young children, they will understand. And then at secondary level, already young students should connect with the mayor or the district officer to talk about the sustainable development of the district, of how to bring electricity for access for everybody, to, but how it can be green. What are the threats of droughts or floods in the community? How to respond to those dangers? One of the wonder, our wonderful colleagues that helps to guide this, Dr. Radhika Iyengar, is from Bhopal, India. She told me a shocking thing about her own life. Bhopal was a site of a massive industrial disaster that killed many thousands of people. It was one of the worst industrial disasters in history. Yet she went through primary school and secondary school without one moment's mention of this disaster in her community. There was no linking the reality of the community, the reality of their lives with the curriculum of the schools. This is a massive failure of imagination. And it's not the kind of education that we can afford any longer. For young people at university level or vocational level, helping to solve the national scale problems. How can our country reach net zero? To understand the challenges, to understand what can be done. Again, experiential. We need our politicians connecting with the students. We need young people with their mayors or with their ministers of energy being part of the problem solving. And that can be part of the education of sustainable development in the future. So I want to thank Stefania. I want to thank UNESCO for its leadership. I want us all to commit to support that global leadership because we need that strong global voice. And when it's there and we have it, we will make education at the center of this initiative. I especially want to thank the teachers here. Please do your magic and also help to ensure that all of the children in your community are in school. And when there aren't enough schools, work on it locally, but also come to us globally. We're trying to mobilize the resources so that you can ensure quality education for every child in every part of the world. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. My name is Judy Brouse, and I'm the Executive Director of the North American Association for Environmental Education. And I'm so happy to be here and be part of this panel to highlight the value of climate change education and the importance of youth voices. And I'm really excited to partner with EarthDay.org and UNESCO. I'm also really excited about bringing education partnership. 
because it's so important to take a holistic view of education, which this program does. And I love the tagline, getting every learner climate ready and the importance of lifelong learning. For those of you who don't know NAAAE, we are the professional association for the field of environmental education. And we'd like to say we're the champion and backbone organization. And we work with educators around the world to do our work. And we're all about advancing environmental literacy and civic engagement using the power of education to create a more just and sustainable future for all. And we also look at how we can help people become more active in civic life and engaged individually and collectively to create change at whatever level people are working at. We're also, like so many of you, focused on justice, equity, diversity, inclusion, and accessibility, looking both internally at our in organization as well as across our partnerships and the work we do globally. The other thing we look at is how education can actually help address all the sustainable development goals, including number four, which is critical about quality education. NAAAE is a network of networks, and we do work with a lot of different networks across North America and around the world. And one I want to mention is the Global Environmental Education Partnership, or the GEEP, which is um, really all about strengthening environmental education by creating this inclusive learning network where we share and learn from each other, share effective practice, and work together to strengthen environmental education. And we work with the Environmental Protection Administration of Taiwan, with the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, and together with advisors from around the world are really looking at how we can strengthen environmental education and scale up the work that we are doing and providing a safe space for all of us to meet and to talk about what we can do together. And we're so lucky to work with these incredible organizations and networks. So climate change is why we're all here. It is the issue of our time. It impacts every other issue that all of us are dealing with. Our tagline at NAAAE is what is the education we need for the world we want? And we think about this in the context of just because we've been doing something doesn't mean we should keep doing it. What is it we need to do to create that world that we want in a changing climate? And so we believe education is a critical tool in our toolbox for addressing climate change. And there are so many ways that we can advance this work and scale up our work together. And we're working on a number of initiatives and partnerships that look at doing research and reporting and looking at policy. And I'm not going to have time to go into all of these, but I encourage you to check out our website to find out more. And I'll just highlight a few things. That there is growing data on the status of climate change education and the gaps and opportunities that exist for all of us in terms of how we can move forward. And one of the projects we've worked on is something looking at mapping the landscape of climate change education in the United States with a focus on policy, but also education in general, working with a number of wonderful partners. We released a report on mapping the K through 12 landscape, and that is on our website if you want to get a copy of it of what we found by doing the scan across the country. And these are just a few of the recommendations, nothing surprising here, except the fact that we know we need to do more, and this shows us where we can have that impact and how we need to focus more on the quality and quantity of what we're doing and thinking about things we haven't thought as much about in the past, like what does it mean to take climate action, incorporate indigenous knowledge, focus on climate justice, and many other things. We also have a higher education report coming out, and that should be released in the next month, looking again high level at what's happening in higher education and climate change education policy. And then we just finished a climate change education survey of 800 teachers and administrators across North America. The bottom line, not surprising, we need to do more, but there were some hopeful things. The teachers and administrators are really concerned about climate change and they wanna do more and they wanna see it integrated across the curriculum in K through 12. But they also gave their schools and districts low scores. So we have a lot to do. They need more support, more resources, more training. And we can do that as educators. So we know what we can do. and We know we can help improve um, this report card. And I want to thank our partners at the Mies Network and the SEPIN Network. And they have a booth here. So you can check, check it out with Marcia, Nicola, and Kristen to find out more about this project. 
And we also are working at climate on um, climate change education policy. Happy to tell you more about that. And you can also check out our website. And a big thank you to my colleague, Sarah Bodor, who is the director of policy at NAAAE. And there's lots more on our website. And I also just wanted to say one last thing before closing about the importance of building leadership. And I'm so happy there are so many young people on this panel and at COP because we cannot do this work without strong leadership from so many people. And young people today are leading the way and they will continue to lead the way and we all have to work together. So building leadership is critical. And I know this time hasn't been easy for so many people. And it's not just the impacts of climate change, it's COVID, it's economic despair and so many other overlapping issues. And we know the impacts, we've seen what is happening around the world with flooding, with storms, with ocean acidification, with rising sea levels, with fires, with drought. And we also have seen the impact of this negative news and what it does to our young people. 75% of young people say they are frightened about their future, and that is a frightening number. But we as educators can help bring the hope and we need to do that. We need to help show people a path forward and what all of us can do to make a difference. If you're really depressed and anxious, you can't do the work. And we need everyone to do the work and we can do it. We can turn things around and prevent some of the worst damage from climate change. I was so excited about the Transforming Education Summit that happened a few months ago. So many good speakers and sessions and messages and we need to build on that we know the world is changing, but to me, that's not just despair. It means that there's going to be new thinking and new jobs and new opportunities and new ways of doing things. And we as educators can help balance that urgency with hope. So I hope we all look at new approaches to how we're going to tackle these issues using the power of education, the need to share what works more generously with each other and work together better. None of us can do this work alone. And I really appreciate all that you are doing. So happy you're there. Wish I was there with you and look forward to hearing how it goes and what all the next steps are. So thank you all so much. Thanks to um, Earth Day and thanks to UNESCO. And have a wonderful panel and a wonderful COP. Thanks so much. I just want to thank uh, Professor Sachs uh, for participating in the panel. He has to run off to another meeting, and also Assistant Director uh, Giannini for her opening remarks, as well as Judy Browse. We're going to move on to the, the second part of our event, which is a, a moderated panel. Uh, our moderator is Ms. Judith Barna, who's the head of education sector for, of international partnerships with the European Commission. And she'll be joined on stage with a panel of uh, youth leaders and education educator leaders, uh, including Zuhair Kaushik from EarthDay.org, Henata Kog from Empodera Klima, Sefisa Milovu, who is the CEO of the Zimbabwe Teachers Association, and Saher uh, Sahid Beg from Makkab. So, if if the five of you will, will will join us here up on the stage, we can uh, get the next part of our session started. Thank you, thank you very much, Matt, uh, for the introduction and for Earth Day for, and UNESCO for uh, organizing the panel and thank especially for the young leaders, uh, to the young leaders for being with us today for I'm sure that a dynamic and interesting conversation. Thanks for really being there. Youth is, as we heard, going to be crucial. Your role is crucial uh, in the work on climate action. Uh, so my name is Judith Barna. I work at the European Commission's International Partnerships uh, Directorate General. And I was given the opportunity just to spend a couple of minutes to bring you some interesting news and information that is really relevant in the context of uh, this uh, session. Because education, youth, 
climate partnerships are really at the heart of a lot of the work that the EU is doing. In the EU, we have the ambitious European Green Deal, and I think we can all recognize that education and youth will be really crucial to be able to reach those ambitious goals and uh, address the causes and impacts of uh, climate change. And some new novelties uh, in that regard. The European Council adopted in June a recommendation to EU member states on learning for the green transition and sustainable development that recognizes that yes, a lot of great work has been done, but we need to step up efforts and support learners and educators uh, even more. We have an exciting new competency framework, the so-called Green Comp, which very much speaks to uh, the goals of the partnership. Uh, it is to support educators and learners to embed uh, environmental sustainability topics into education systems and curricula across EU member states. It is not new, but I wanted to mention the Education for, Cli uh, for Climate Coalition, which is a participatory community uh, that brings together teachers, students, uh, various education stakeholders to act collectively on innovative solutions uh, for uh, the green transition. On the climate side, we have the flagship initiative, the Global Climate Change Alliance Plus, which is active with projects in 34 countries across the world. And it is great news because 24 of those are targeting education and youth. And as to international partnerships, um, so let's say my home ground, we are really happy because we have high level political commitment to youth and education uh, through uh, the commitment of uh, my commissioner, uh, Jutta Urpilainen. The Global Gateway Strategy, as Professor Sachs mentioned, it is something that brings together infrastructure, extremely important, but it also recognizes that hard infrastructure investments are not enough. We have to really prioritize education, so education is a pillar of that strategy to make sure that human development also happens uh, for more equitable and inclusive uh, transformations. And of course financing, that was one of the big topics uh, at the Transforming Education Summit. Uh, our commis my commissioner uh, committed 10% of our international partnership budget to uh, education, and 35% of our uh, budget uh, goes for climate action. And of course, when it comes together, that means that we have quite a lot of activity uh, together with partner countries. We have uh, green learning addressed in some way or another through skills, TVET, youth actions in some 30 countries uh, around the world. And last but not least, I would like to introduce you or reintroduce you uh, to our brand new Youth Action Plan uh, that came out uh, in October. Uh, it is really to uh, make sure that we do put youth in the center of the, of the EU's external action. It has three pillars, engage, empower, and, uh, and connect youth. And we really hope that this is a great moment when we implement it, also because it comes after the Transforming Education Summit. And we supported youth consultations uh, for the summit. We supported the development of the youth declaration. And we will be following the implementation because what will be important is that uh, the words do not stay words. They do not stay words on paper or fly away as we as we say them, uh, but that we really act on them. Which leads me to the panel, and, uh, and uh, it, is a, it is a great honor uh, to hear your thoughts about this uh, partnership. And uh, we will go through three rounds of uh, questions. And the first one is really quite a simple one. It is, uh, I would really love you to introduce yourselves, to talk a bit about what you do and what is your relationship to uh, the Greening Education Partnerships. And um, the floor is yours. Let's start with you, Sofiso. The, 
Thank you very much, moderator. Um, my name is Fison Lovu. I am a teacher by profession, and I would like to share with you that uh, I've been in the teaching field. This is my 37th year. I started teaching at 19 years, and I am associated with trade union, and my organization, Zimta, is a member of the Education International, a global federation of educators. And in that sphere, we are advancing the concept of quality climate change education. And that's how we relate ourselves to greening schools. That's how we relate ourselves to greening learning. That's how we relate ourselves to greening communities and indeed greening capacities for the educators that we are involved in. So briefly, that's who I am. And my presentation, therefore, today intervention is talking to that greening concept in that sphere. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sufi. So indeed, teachers are at the heart of what we would like to achieve. Uh, Sahir, can I go over to you? Yeah, sure. Thank you so much. Uh, so I, as I'm representing Maka, and both Mockup and the SOS International and SOS UK are members of the partnership. So what we do at Mockup, for example, is that we all of our all of us as young people push forward the policy demands focused on climate justice and education, how to make education green by also not in the only in the classrooms, but also outside the classrooms, about which we will talk, you know, in the next question. So I think that this is a very short, nice introduction about the partnership and the relationship of ours. Thank you. Indeed, you're absolutely right. We are talking about formal education, non-formal, but also informal education. There's so much uh, to do there as well. And uh, next, uh, Zuhair, and maybe I can also share the mic with you so the other can pass among the others. Hello, I'm Zuhair. I work with Earth Day and I'm a I think it's working now. So I'm Zuhair. I work with Earth Day and I'm working with Earth Day since 2019. And I'm a youth climate educator and policy advocate from Bangladesh. We So in, uh, in global south countries, like in Bangladesh, in India, we work with schools and universities to uh, promote climate literacy. We uh, utilize the time of morning assembly uh, to educate our young people. We work with the uh, teachers uh, so that uh, our toolkits that we have prepared, prepared for the schools, educators, and uh, youth educators and teachers are promoted. And that's how we work with uh, uh, educators and teachers. Yeah. Thank you so much, Zuhar. I don't know what was with the mics, uh, but over to you, Renata. Uh, thank you. Can you all hear me? Yes. Um, all right. Hello, everyone. It's so great uh, to be here. It's my first day at COP, so it's really exciting to start it off like this, and especially talking about climate education. It's my fourth COP, and it's the first time that I'm seeing such a powerful space for climate education. Um, so I'm the founder and director of Empodera Clima, we're one of the partners for the event. Empodera Clima is working on gender and climate justice, especially through education, because we believe that in order to change what we're seeing in the negotiations here at COP, for example, on having more diversity and representation in the climate negotiations, we need to start empowering young people through education, through access to information, to what's happening around here. And we believe that if we're able to empower young women, especially young women from the global south, from Latin America, from Brazil, which is where I'm from, we can really do something powerful to the outcomes of this conference. So that's kind of the stance that I'm coming from with Empodera Clima and some other hats such as Yango, which is the youth constituency of the UN Climate Change. So leading some of the gender work, there's also really great work happening on ACE, Action for Climate Empowerment. So it's really, I think, an example of young people taking the stage and not being just, you know, activists and participants, but negotiators, leaders, and perhaps decision makers, if we can have that space. So it's great to be here. Absolutely. And what you're saying actually is really reading to the second question, which is delving a bit uh, into, into your work. 
how you see your or your organization's role in uh, the greening education partnership. Can you pinpoint any examples that are good practices, that are initiatives that you know are actually working and would be really interesting to be picked up through the partnership together with others? And I have to, wow, we, we really try to mix you so that we don't go through exactly the same order. So I have to see. Zuhar, you're the first on this question. So I hope this, this time Mike will not <laughs> play with me. So um, Earth Day is actually doing a lot on climate literacy in 2017. We have declared environmental and climate literacy as a theme of Earth Day. And we literally declare uh, the themes. And we don't forget about those. We promote the, the, those themes. And we work with partners on those. So Earth Day is actually working with governments and ministers for mainstreaming climate education in a national curriculum. And also, uh, uh, we are supporting young people, uh, especially in Bangladesh. I'm working with uh, uh, clubs and uh, associations and universities. We are, uh, we are actually operating climate literacy campaigns in different universities in different parts of the country. And we are trying to blend literacy and skill with activism. We want young people to learn and uh, you know, take actions after learning rather than maybe shouting and <laughs> showing up with uh, posters. And um, we are providing hands-on training and vocational training in, in, uh, in Bangladesh. Uh, especially, I have partnered with two universities uh, in the north part of Bangladesh and the southern part of Bangladesh. And uh, we have mobile, uh, educated around 5,000 youths. Uh, in, in Bangladesh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Zuhar. Uh, you're really doing amazing work, uh, linking with uh, policy, with government, uh, working hands-on with students, uh, with, with educators. And, and this is, I think, an amazing thing about how youth, uh, grassroots initiatives, youth organizations can uh, contribute. But I'm not going to run ahead uh, towards the second question, but give you the floor. Renata. Thank you. Um, so the question is sharing about the work of greening. Yeah, indeed. Like uh, in your work, do you see already uh, any good practices that are something to bring to uh, the greening partnership, greening education? Yeah, partner? definitely. Um, I think this is a great, great project, great partnership. But I also think something that we've been doing that I think is really at the core as well is especially when you're talking about something that can be so complex like climate change by right, climate science bringing that back to y children and youth and making it resonate with their reality is super important and i believe jeffrey sachs also talked about this in the beginning about kind of bridging the gap between just the kind of technical aspects into action as well um something we do at empodera clima is translating content, so translating gender and climate content to Portuguese, to Spanish, because I think a lot of times it's hard when we don't have access to a lot of these main documents, a lot of these main guidelines, guidebooks about climate education. So translating literally, but also in translating the language, right? We, we talk a lot about tropicalizing a lot of, you know, the Paris Agreement, a lot of this content to make it to make it make sense for indigenous youth that are on the ground doing this work, but they just don't put a name as you know climate education or green education, because it's what they do, right? So I think being able to bridge those gaps is something that we've, we've um, worked on doing at Empodera Clima, and really tailoring climate education content to be fun, to be exciting, uh, because I think at least how I learned in school was it was very, you know, just hard line and the science, and it, it doesn't feel like it's our reality, right? And I think it's changing. You're seeing a lot of amazing, powerful teenagers already coming out of high school, middle school, and doing that work. But if we're able to access those people specifically, we're not only changing education, but those are the people that are probably going to be making the rules, right? When uh, if, if we do things right, if we're able to have green skills in schools and do that type of work. Um, and then the last thing I'll say is just making sure that um, we're intersectional about it because there's really cool studies that I can share statistics later as well about girls' education for climate and how when we're able to empower young women and girls with 
green skills with kind of really practical experience that they can then use and to get jobs in the green economy and renewable energy that really is just like a change making scenario so if we're able to bring gender race other aspects of intersectionality into education and make sure that it's not like a silo that separates study within the classroom i think it can be really powerful for what those kids come up come and do after so it's what we're trying to do with empodera clima but we're just small organization and we need the education system and decision makers and everyone that is on that powerful decision making tables to be on board with that as well Thank you so much, uh, Renata. So indeed, intersectionality, really, really important. And as you pointed out, speaking the language, speaking the language of youth, I mean, if you want to reach them, of course, translating, but really the way of bringing messages home to them and allow them to take those messages uh, further amongst themselves and not just among themselves is uh, and will be crucial uh, for uh, this partnership. And uh, Sufiso, in, um, from the point of view of educators. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, let me start by mentioning that uh, from the education international point of view, right up to affiliate levels, the belief of quality climate change education is strong. And that's why we believe that it, it is the tap root for education for sustainable development. And as a tap root, we also believe that it is a lifelong experience, which means it is a continuous process that we should see innovation coming in into education. Not only lifelong, it is also life-wide. Life-wide meaning that uh, we are looking at those values and attitudes that become the rail card of education for sustainable development and quality climate change education. And we talk of also life deep. Life deep, we are talking about the skills and knowledge that the learners must get. And that is what will inculcate their sustenance in terms of lifelong, life-wide education for sustainable development. And then what are the roles of education? Or precisely, what have we done? And if I may talk about acting locally, and influencing globally. In Zimbabwe, we have instituted a curriculum review, which was a strong advocacy from the educators. A curriculum review that has now mainstreamed climate change education into objectives that cut across the learning areas. We no longer call them subjects. We call them learning areas because they are seamless in integration and therefore climate change education becomes a cross-cutting uh, view which is now part of the curriculum and that has been going on since 2015 and in 2022 we are marking the end of the seven-year period and we are now going into a review of that curriculum at tertiary level we have encouraged the encouragement the, the, the development of inheritance education which is in heritage education 5.0 which takes into consideration the understanding of the learners of their environment so that they can manipulate it and survive in it and take advantage of their innovative nature with their health. That is a strong action that we've taken and we're moving forward with that action. But we don't stop there. We have a research unit at Education International which we continue to do research and researching on what? On development of participatory learning pedagogies which will unleash the potential of educators into participation. And of instance, I will talk to you about um, our thinking around um, this event, for example. This is a good learning env environment. If we were pro part of the process in organizing that I have said, why not involve the youth in dealing with what we call adversity profiling. What has this uh, event about climate change done to produce what is dangerous to the climate that we're talking about? Then the learners begin to profile how we are impacting in our actions day to day on the environment. And when they do so, they can then bring about the necessary knowledge that we also learn 
and exercise. So this is a practical example. Uh, I have done that with um, my own ideas of saying, let's act locally. When I say locally, act within your home first before you can go out. And I've done that with all my own children, my own son, who, who has taken up interest in this. As I talk about climate change and sustainable environment, he has taken interest into it, studying an honors, uh, bachelor's honors in urban planning, emphasizing on waste management, solid waste management. He has taken interest into plastic, and that has shown us even at home level, managing the plastic that we do. And out of that, created stools that will be used by learners in our environment. Now we have begun to collect from the environment, the neighbors, and on to the community. That's influencing locally with a correct attitude and skill, and then you can impact globally. That's the beginning of how we can change the world when we act locally, and then we can influence internationally. So in short, therefore, we are introducing the e e concept of resilient education. This is how education can sustain itself and become resilient against adversities and perpetuate existence. In short, that's what we are doing, and that's what the organization has been doing, and we wish to continue in that sphere. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. You brought very important considerations. Uh, of course, SDG 4 is about lifelong learning, but indeed, up until now, we haven't mentioned lifelong learning in this panel yet. You brought the importance of, yes, global influencing, global events are extremely important, but ultimately, we need to see change happen at home, really at home and, uh, and, and, and locally. And also, you mentioned research. Without research, without more evidence, it will be very difficult to move forward. Thank you very much. Zahir, over to you. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, and I'm, I'm feeling really happy that I came last this intervention because it was amazing seeing what you all have mentioned and how we have a lot of interlinkages with what we are doing at Marka, for example, because this is what it looks like. And I'm, I'm specifically really proud of what Markup is doing because we are proving that young people are not only the ones who need to be, you know, at the core of the climate, uh, climate education or sustain education for sustainable development, but they are the ones who are driving this for this agenda forward as well. So we have two of very good practices to share. One of them is teach the teacher and the other one is called teach the parent. So uh, there we actually give young people the resources knowledge base and skills to teach the teacher that basically have a conversation with um, it, th their educators to, about what climate education is for example and how it can be you know improved with a young person's perspective and also about teach the parent because i think that we all, all have been mentioning starts from home starts from home and young people i think in my opinion most of the children young people they recognize the importance of sustainable education for sustainable development i mean how many of us are young people and we see like oh i need climate education i mean a lot of us recognize that we need that a lot of us recognize that you know there are resources available for which we strive towards like learning and everything. And it's important that we make it accessible for the ones who do not have it available because it's such a question of privilege. And what we actually do at Mockup is to make these resources available to such group of young people. I have amazing colleagues present here in the room from Brazil and Bangladesh who are making that happen on ground every day in their communities. And I'm really proud of them. Um, taking that education forward with you know with the parents taking that climate edu the topic of climate education and sustainable development on their dining tables you know and then taking it in their classroom why we need it why it's important why do you need to kind of bring it into the curricula is a very important and crucial conversation that is led by young people because you know uh, According to Agenda 21, uh, that was the outcome of the Rio Art Summit, the young people are the key stakeholders to achieve sustainable development. We are among the nine major groups. If, we do, if it's not going to be with us, 
uh, it's not going to be you know meaningful at all so uh, i think that those two of the very meaningful uh, very uh, i think that good practices that i want i wanted to mention because it also gives young people the uh, the opportunity i think and also a way forward to engage with their education ministries then because this is where you know if we want to change a policy an education policy this is from where the change starts so i think it's all about capacity building and also a community based uh, you know practice the teach the teacher and teach the parent uh, so if you guys want to know more about it we will be really happy to have a conversation with the end of this panel as well thank you thank you so much for bringing in the point that uh, we think about children and young people as you know people who need to be taught, right? But actually, you do have agency. You do have a lot of opportunities to also uh, influence and teach teachers and within your own households, your parents and your communities. So thanks a lot for that. And we stay on the question of youth, of course. So you contributed a lot to making this partnership happen. There were focus groups. Um, ahead of the Transforming Education Summit. There was very active participation. So now the partnership is there. So how do you see the involvement of youth in the future of the partnership? How can they bring, uh, bring forward? Okay, all of a sudden, I used to be a translator and all of a sudden I, I see that you know, I have problems with English. So how can we make sure that youth will be a supporting force for this partnership thing. And again, the order, the order. Sifiso, let's start with you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, in my view, uh, the partnership can be enhanced by establishing what I would like to call the Quality Climate Change Education Corps. That means we are getting internationally networked as young people and uh, crossing across, uh, giving a cross boundary education about the effects of climate change in our various continents. So if we, we get the education corps, then they can become our ambassadors in that field. Then they start propagating this education and moving the agenda forward. That's an important element to me of this education corps that we are talking about. It's an army that we have that we can unleash to the world to educate the world about climate change. That's how I see the youth coming in in a strong way. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And uh, Zahir, now it's not, you're not the last, so thanks. Yes. Well, I mean, I still feel lucky anyways. Thank you. <laughs> so, uh, no, I, I think that uh, bringing back the point again, right? So where I ended, making, uh, giving the young people the skills to engage with the decision makers, the environment ministries, the climate ministries, uh, the ministries of education, because it's a very interlinked role to then integrate the policies that they want to see, for example, right, uh, in these, uh, a a at the end of the day. I just want to also highlight one of the most important points here. I don't know how many of you in this room uh, today know that the Paris Agreement actually mentioned scientific knowledge, scientific education, when they, when they actually address knowledge and education, they leave behind a huge important portion of our society, which are usually not in the rooms, which are the indigenous communities, human rights defenders. They do not include the traditional knowledge. If we still leave that behind, while we are making sustainable development uh, as you know at the core of our education system we leave still leave behind a huge part of this you know making the ambition turning the ambition into action element i think right because a lot of the people they don't even know and this has been going around and this is why bringing the young people in these spaces like cop is important it's crucial because they know what they're doing they know what they're advocating for Right, so it's not really just a, again. I, it feels like I'm repeating myself, but it's a really crucial point. It's not about doing education for young people or greening the education for young people. For example, it's about greening the education with young people, with the children, 
not leaving behind the traditional knowledge, for example, so that the, when, when these conversations are happening with the education ministries, when they are making their curricula, it, the, these conversations are inclusive of young people on the table as an equal voice and equal stakeholders at the decision so that you know the decisions are made for them are not kind of leaving them behind because i think all, all, a lot of us have been listening to this very good code uh, around the rooms here and there and side events it's called nothing about us without us i think that it has the very as essence if we want to achieve meaningful sustainable development in education yeah. Thank you so much. So, Education Corps, ambassadors, having a space at the table, uh, discuss really with decision makers and inclusion, uh, leaving nobody behind, as we say very often uh, amongst education actors, but this is really something uh, that, uh, that we can bring home from this uh, conversation as well. And uh, Zuhair, over to you. So young people, they have created a momentum of youth engagement in all aspects already. And uh, uh, in this partnership, I, I think that with uh, fierce advocacy, we have a room to um, incorporate climate education in the national curriculums where in, in many countries we don't have mandatory climate education. I mean, I think that young people, they have to push for this through their fierce uh, advocacy. And then uh, uh, also the, the recent concern that we need to engage, need to incorporate environmental human rights based approaches in our education that should be uh, taken into consideration. And I think young people as mobilizers, you know, advocates, they can do that. They have to push for that. And also young people, it's not just young people that we need to um, uh, uh, work for this partnership. Also, we need to provide education to our older generation to change their attitude and actions uh, towards climate action. Yeah. Thank you so much. Indeed, it is so right. And uh, I think in many ways, youth are actually leading the way and definitely not following. So, thank you. Renata. Yeah, it's, it's tough to be last this time because I feel like there's been a lot of powerful statements that have been said already. Um, so this specific question made me think of the Transforming Education Summit uh, and all that we represented. Um, this past summer, I was a fellow at the UN Office of the Youth Envoy, so I got to help shape uh, the youth declaration process, which was this amazing, powerful document that was submitted to the Secretary General and then informed the Transforming Education Summit decisions uh, in, in summary, but it's really, really a powerful document that was shaped by, with, and for youth in, in all senses. Uh, and I got to see a little bit of that process. And I mean, UNESCO led that really beautifully. And I think it really shows that youth are, it really showed an example of youth being key stakeholders in the decision making, right? It's not like we're doing a survey, can put your decisions and then with that we'll decide on something. It's youth writing what they want this declaration process to be. It's youth thinking about what their local national realities mean and then bringing that to the global level and you know seeing where the overlaps, the gaps are in, in, a, in a more global perspective. So I think that was a super powerful example and if we can kind of mimic the youth declaration process in other areas and we're able to bring young people in that role, I think that would be super powerful. And the other thing I was thinking about is connecting the dots because I feel like there's more and more, luckily, right, um, climate education initiatives happening and different organizations talking about it. But I think sometimes we're not as much in, in sync. So being able to bring the Greening Education's partnership of UNESCO with other organizations and making sure that we're like one powerful movement for climate education in all senses. I think that would be um, really, really powerful. And also national governments as well, because something that I noticed in this youth declaration process is that even though there was a lot of space within like the UN to be a part of it and to feedback processes, some governments didn't really have, you know, a space for young people to have a direct dialogue with the decision makers for education in their country or climate and that affected the process right so i'm really big on advocating for participatory democratic processes if we're able to 
bringing people to, you know, the local city hall and the, the local cong uh, the, the congress of each country so that these young people can inform and feedback their local experiences in that sense. So I think we're doing that. I think the climate hub here, the climate education hub here is super powerful. Last year we did an event at the Green Zone at COP26 on um, gender transformative education for climate with Plan International, the Malala Fund, the UN Girls Education, and that was super powerful, but it was all over, all the way over in the green zone for those that were a COP, super far away from the blue zone negotiations, from the diplomatic negotiations. So I guess my invite as the, the last speaker, I guess, on this session, uh, on this question is, let's take what we are discussing here, all the different perspectives from government, from civil society, academia, teachers, everything, and bring that to the other spaces. Talk to the people that are in charge of the outcomes of COP27 this year. And then when the outcomes do come, let's make sure that that's reflected into what we do nationally, right? Because I think sometimes there's a weird silo between the beautiful work that we do here internationally and then when we go back home, what we see happening in our schools, in our classrooms, right? So bridging those gaps and connecting those dots, I think would be a nice next step in terms of the partnership. Need, thank you so much. Uh, as we followed the consultation process for the youth declaration, it was really amazing to see the engagement, really thousands of young people connecting to the online consultations, providing their input. Also, it will be interesting to see that these are great processes that influence outcomes of, let's say, big campaigns for big events, but how can we, let's say, replicate similar uh, inclusive and engaging uh, ways of working in more, let's say, everyday work uh, when, when we go back home. And also, indeed, there are a lot of stakeholders in this partnership. Everybody with their specific added value, their experience, their knowledge, their know-how. And we can see it just looking around that there's so many things happening. The partnership is a great way to bring all that together so that everybody can really work in the same direction, right? So not uh, really um, a bit all over. So really create more scale and more uh, focus. And with that, I don't know, Matt, do we, have, um, do we have questions in the audience? Maybe we have some time. So two questions, please. Thank you so much. My name is Sylvia Washira. I'm coordinator for the Nairobi Summer School on Climate Justice, an initiative of the Pan-African Climate Justice Alliance, which is uh, the, the biggest uh, civil society on climate change and climate justice. And um, I mean, I'm very happy to be in this meeting because it resonates with what we do. And in our work of climate justice and climate change in, uh, in, in, in Africa, we realize that there's a lot of, there's a huge gap between in, in the community where the communities don't know how climate change is affecting them. And yet they are the communities we, our partners work with and we are always in this meeting and all that. So it is on this basis that we felt together with other partners, including uh, the, the UNESCO higher education and e economy in Kenya is also a brainchild of the Nairobi Summer School, we felt that there is need to, to, to teach these grassroots communities on, on how climate change is affecting them. So the Nairobi Summer School, we, we reach out to young people, farmers, uh, you know, it's a mixture of the government, uh, practitioners, communities, and not just Africa, even the global south. Because the, the first Nairobi summer school, for example, we had participants from Puerto Rico, Costa Rica, Malaysia, Philippines, and all that. And in this school, we, what we do is that we bring um, practitioners, like for example, the African group of negotiators, Care International, UNESCO, you know, they come and they teach. And the target group is normally like leaders, like if leaders that are already work, they have grassroots initiatives, you know? And the kind of things we teach them is like, for example, what is COP? What is resilience? You know, in a practical way, we, we, we 
deliberately, and we partner with Kenyatta University, we deliberately in this school don't talk jargon. It's very practical uh, school. And um, the, the results of this with the alumni that we have seen, and I, would, um, I mean, uh, the, this bridging the, the gaps with the vulnerable communities is that, yeah, yeah, so is that they, during this COP, you'd see they were helping get voices. They were helping recording voices. Over here, I'm seated with some of the alumni of the school. Like, the, from, like for given from Ma 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 Madagascar, they were able to get voices, capture voices, and all that. So I'm very happy to be here, and I would like to, ask to, to, to network with all of you and see how we can partner and expand to other communities. Thank you. I'll try to keep it very short. Uh, my name is Ismail. I work with UNICEF. Um, thanks very much for uh, sharing. Um, just a question. Uh, I mean, in my experience, uh, when we talk about partnerships, uh, of course, we are talking about uh, the supply uh, where the education system comes into place. Uh, and oftentimes, there is quite a bit in the edu education scene uh, where there is not really uh, openness to integrate climate change education. Oftentimes it's just treated as uh, scientific uh, information um, and it's not really uh, tailored to the current challenges. So my question to the panel here is uh, how to get this buy-in from the educational uh, stakeholders. Uh, and of course on the demand side, um, how about the private sector? I think that's also something we need to look into uh, because eventually the skills that we are learning it's not just uh, to save ourselves from the impacts of climate change, but also to make them useful, you know, to contribute to addressing uh, some of these uh, challenges. And the last point is uh, about, I think there was something mentioned about the narrative, to localize the narrative, because so far, a lot of content is quite Western. It's not really localized to the issues of the global South, if I may uh, call it so. So how to localize the narrative so that people can really relate to uh, knowledge and the issues of climate change. Thank you. Okay. So, thank you very much for those questions. Um, we have time for a quick round of closing remarks. So, if you have any good um, examples of how you managed to reach the policymakers, how did you manage to reach maybe work with private sector. If you can provide any answers to this, please feel free. And really the final word is, what would you like the audience to take away from this uh, conversation? And pass on the mic. Let's start with that. Okay, so uh, the closing, as a closing remark, I would say that, uh, I mean, through this uh, green, uh, greening education partnership, we are going to uh, maybe promote climate literacy at all level, uh, but we have to think how we are engaging youth in this partnership. Most of the time we see young people as beneficiary and vulnerable stakeholder, and we cons considering that we design projects and actions, and most of the time that fails. So we need to design, we need to actually change or transform our thoughts that we have to consider young people as a partner in developing and greening this uh, education. Thank you. Um, this has been a great, great conversation and thank you for the comments and questions. Um, I think there's a lot that we could keep talking about, but unfortunately we don't have that much time. Uh, so for now I'll just say, um, I think it's really important that we bring this discussion that's happening here forward. And I can't emphasize that enough past COPs, you know, whenever I talk about gender and climate, for example, there's so many people, including negotiators, that don't know about it and not aware, and the stakes of that, we need to understand the stakes of not having climate education at the center of the discussion, not have having gender and climate justice at the center of the discussion, and that's why the meaningful youth engagement and participation changes things, because we know the stakes, right? We're, yes, it's our future, but it's our present now, too, and we're seeing that, especially in more vulnerable communities. And so, as I think has been said in the comments too, I think 
it's not like we need to give the voice to young people to do this or anything. Young people, for example, indigenous young people in Brazil, they're already leading, it's clear. But we're seeing the gap into, in the decision-making spaces in the government and here as well, right? Even though it's, it's improving, they're all in the civil society space where the you know, indigenous negotiators, right? I think there's a lot more that we can do in terms of bringing that representation and diversity because that will automatically lead to more just solutions, including climate education. So if you're a decision making here or if you have any part in that, I think it's important to push that forward and localize it after. When you go back to your home countries, think about how, how that can be um, adapted to your realities, right? Because we know that this perspective of the UN, of the global north and any, all of that is not really how it works. So let's leverage the fact that we're in Africa, the fact that we're in Egypt, and change a little bit of that narrative, that scenario to a more um, global south perspective that is thinking about vulnerable communities, but it's also thinking about the leadership that those communities have and need to be reflected in this space. Thank you very much. Um, I think there are two very important linked question, uh, rather comments and question at the same time. Um, the issue that was raised by my sister from Kenya, where she talks about the gap between the lived experiences and how people are taught and knowledge about what is happening around them. And I link it to the issue of uh, buy-in and community participation. Um, that is very important because we definitely have to include communities. But in the approach to the community problems, we don't identify problems for them and then we bring answers to them. That's the, that, that's the approach that we should avoid as much as possible. Allow them to identify the problems and then bring the solutions where you come in to facilitate but if you stand up there and pontificate to them the answers, they may rebuff the idea and stand back and allow you to work the way you want to work. That's how I think in community development and in change management, you want to work around. Then your approach to influencing change in regulatory policies and principles in government. Uh, from a trade union experience, uh, I know trade unions have been known to be very forceful and they are viva ginger around and uh, sometimes that doesn't work with governments. You definitely need to seek their cooperation. And when you seek their cooperation, you need really to approach them in a manner that is developmental, that is going to bring positive to their agendas as well. So you must fit also into the glo global agenda of the organizations, then we can influence them from within, and that is my idea of how partnerships would succeed when you are inside that. Um, I would have wanted also to deal with the issue of the organizing narrative, but I think I missed some points. However, I want to believe that uh, um, the issues that we're having here in terms of partnership from an education point of view um, we would like to see the greening of capacities of our educators. In my introduction remarks, I told you that I've been in the field for 37 years. That must tell you how ancient my ideas are. And if I don't renew them, and if you don't renew me, I may become obsolete, and I may become extinct like a dinosaur. So I need to really to be renewed continuously as a teacher. And that's where partnership begins, to green the capacities of our educators to remain relevant in quality climate change education so that they can handle the modern learner who needs that support. Thank you. Uh, OK, yes, all the claps for him. but. Uh, I really love the question that you mentioned, especially the last part of it. 
And I really want to address that as the, global, uh, as the daughter of the Global South. Because what you mentioned is that really just one point to put everything into perspective. How do you fight a system that is not made for you? You forget the you and you forget the I, and you forget the V, you just focus on us. Because all of these spaces are a huge question of privilege. I had to fight to, to get to where, you know, get to here. I know that all of you who are coming from the Global South had to fight, even if it's a Global South country, which is very ironic, uh, you had to fight to get to here, to get to this place today, right? Don't forget that this, coming to this place does not mean just coming with your individuality. It means coming with the voices of your communities. It means, this, and this is how we fight, you know, uh, bringing that local perspective, bringing those voices that could not make it today. This is how we can include them. Because we have to be, as young person, or even, you know, when, no matter where you're working at, no matter what you're working with in the climate education, you have to recognize that climate justice is a matter of political will. And it's not a political will only by the system. It's a political will of every single individual present here in this day, room today. You know, I choose to represent the voices of people who did not make it today in this room. And we all choose to represent, you know, the voices of the, for example, indigenous people. We don't have to talk in, on behalf of them, but we just, where, whichever room we are in, we just have to make sure that those local perspectives, those local voices are mentioned there. You know, so that the world leaders don't forget them while they're making those policies. This is the basic responsibility that I see, for, at least for myself, right? So uh, I really think that, you know, working at local level, this is how we can actually bring those perspectives into the room. Just talk to your community more. Be like, be more community oriented. Young people have consultations all the time. I think that my colleagues, again, my colleagues here, work a lot at, you know, at the grassroots level at, at the Global South, both of them are from the Global South, I think. So they're bringing all the voices together. So if you are a young person, just engage in the community, share this space, because this space only gets you know, wider and stronger when you share it. Uh, and as many, as, as many diverse voices, just as Renata, Renata said, we can bring to the table, the more, you know, the or more amplified, amplified the message can be. So yeah, got a little emotional, but sorry for that. Great. Wow. Thank you so much. You've been so inspirational. It's an honor to be with you and share this stage. Thank you very much. And I hand over to Stefania Giannini for a final word, I think. Thank you very much. Thank you for this uh, inspiring uh, discussion. Uh, I mean, I wish to mention uh, the four pillars of this uh, partnership, a green in education partnership, starting from the last, which is maybe the first, green in communities. I mean, we have a clear mind about the role of communities and including uh, indigenous people, including cultural diversity. I mean, UNESCO is the house to promote and to protect cultural diversity. And this is not, and this is exactly the case uh, when it comes to education and uh, this uh, 4.7 mission which climate change education is an important part of. Greening teacher capacity and not making teachers as all we can become obsolete because of lack of knowledge and lack of training. We are absolutely on your side. And it's great to see that teachers on the ground are already moving like this, not simply but acting on that. Greening learning, it's about the content, it's about curricula, it's about the change we need, not simply a couple of hours on climate change, that's to be very clear, but it's about making the approach, knowledge, awareness, behaviors, and making the schools, and all the other uh, informal education uh, to provide uh, with uh, ch learners, uh, children, but also adults, with the capacity to understand and to act accordingly. And last but not least, green is schools. That means schools are places where things have to change. Also in, the, in terms of how you organize the learning environment, how schools are managed, and the role of principals in this process. So I think that 
connecting the dots, Renata, I, li I like very much because it's exactly the force we are doing is a possibility we have in our hands. I wish to say in the end really that um, the Secretary General Guterres, when uh, you submitted the youth declaration in New York, I'm sure you remember, he was talking about four different stages in the discussion with young people. Exclusion, the first. Listening, the second. Consulting, the third. And responsibility, the fourth. We are there. Now it's a common responsibility. We have uh, a demand and we have uh, uh, a clear action plan. It's about uh, joining in this common effort and having an objective. Dubai 2023 should be the COP where education is part officially of the blue zone, I have to say, and the negotiation. And this is our common mission. Thank you very much. So before we wrap up and, and give applause to all of our panelists, if you enjoyed this event and this session, just after this, we have another uh, exciting education-related event hosted by Education International, where they'll talk about educators on a healing planet. So please stick around and, and, and learn some more uh, with us and teach us some things as well. Uh, but with that, I'll, I'll close out the event. Please, a, a round of applause for all of our panelists. This was excellent, and, and thank you all for showing up. Uh, please follow our work at, at earthday.org. Thank you again.